Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. The Fear of Red Lights. That's the new book. It's in stores now, written by Jacqueline A. Williams. And I'm super excited. Jacqueline is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we're going to talk all about that book. Jacqueline, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for your time, Jacqueline. Can you tell me about The Fear of Red Lights? What can readers expect when they open this up? So the book, The Fear of the Red Lights, people can expect, and this is for readers of all ages, it was geared more towards children, but I find that parents can really learn something from this too. But it's more about encouraging children and people around the world to follow their dreams and to never let nothing or no one stop them, no matter what comes their way. I love the message, Jacqueline. Where did the idea come from? Where, how were you inspired to write it? <laughs> so actually, the idea is stemmed from my own childhood. Growing up, writing was always my passion. It was my way of getting through some of my darkest moments of my life. I started out with poetry. And I remember when I was in the fifth grade, I had a teacher who would tell me, you know, I would never be anything. She Mm. blatantly would humiliate me in front of my classmates. And it got so bad to the point where I had to move and switch schools. And I just remember breaking down in the classroom and I had this one friend who comforted me and she was patting my back and asking me if I was okay. And it just stemmed from that. And I was like, you know, I'm going to use my pain and turn it into purpose. I'm going to like go full on with this because there are other children who can learn from this experience. Well, when it comes to writing and publishing, Jacqueline, have you ever done anything like this before? I have never written a book before, but it has always been a dream of mine as well. Oh, wow. How long did this take you to write and put through all those publishing hoops? Would you believe me if I said only four months tops? Oh, wow. Because it just comes so naturally, like writing across the board, writing papers in school, anything you give me writing, you name it, I got it. Then that day comes, Jacqueline, and you open up your mailbox, and there it is, first copy of your book. And your name's on the cover. I mean, that had to be crazy for you. What was that moment like? Yes, it was very crazy. (laughs) I screamed to the top of my lungs. And (laughs) so for me, I'm a very firm believer of God, and I believe that He orchestrates our lives, and He can make a way out of no way. And the funny thing about that situation is that I had went on a fast. I went on a three-day fast, and my last day of my fast, I go downstairs. And I see the package on the table, and it says Jacqueline A. Williams, The Fear of the Red Light. I'm like, wait, no way, <laughs> because the book came way before its time. I'm like, wait, I was supposed to be waiting like an extra two weeks, and it came like way before the two weeks, and I, all I could do is just drop to my knees and cry and just like scream pure happiness. A lot of people who are listening right now, Jacqueline, are authors who are just starting out, just like you were. Do you have anything that you picked up along the way that you could throw at them for advice? Patience is key. Patience, and you want to make sure that you're organized. And I would say stick to what you love. And and writing may not be a thing that you love, but if you have a certain niche, like you just want to stick to that and make that your your book, make that what your what your story is going to tell. I have a feeling, Jacqueline, that this isn't the last we're going to see from you. Do you have plans for writing more? Yes, absolutely. And I also have plans to become a motivational speaker and to just travel around the world and speak to young ladies and and young men around the world. Because children, that's my ministry. Hmm. A lot of times, Jacqueline, when you love to write, it also means that you love to read. What kind of reader would you say you are? I don't know how what word you can use to describe this, but I'm reading all the time. Hmm. Like, you can ne- there will never be a day where you'll catch me without a book in my hand or reading something. Now, looking back over the whole project here, Jacqueline, what's the most rewarding aspect for you now of being a published author? The most rewarding thing is that I'm touching lives Mm. and I'm changing lives and I'm encouraging people. And as long as I can do that, like a lot of people, they'll publish for money or it's an extra income. This is my love. Under Mm. God, this is my first love. So for me to encourage and to transform lives, that speaks volumes to me. I can never get paid a dime for this book, but to know that I changed the life will touch my heart forever. 
I think a lot of readers are really going to be into this book. I encourage everyone listening to go seek this one out. It's called The Fear of Red Lights. It's written by Jacqueline A. Williams. It's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find it anywhere, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and iTunes and down the street at your local bookshop. All these places are going to find this book. Jacqueline, I really appreciate you coming on the show and telling me all about your work, and you certainly motivated me. I really enjoyed our time. Thank you for the opportunity, and you have a wonderful day. This is the story of one man's determination and a testament to the power of the human spirit. It's the new novel by David B. Roach. It's called One Sad Universe, and we get to talk all about this book right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. David is here with me. David, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. You know, I really believe that almost anyone, really anyone can become an author if they want to be. Mm. If they really try and they, and they really apply themselves. You know, I'm an Ohio State grad, and I have a master's degree from uh, Central Michigan University. But you don't have to have a whole long arm list full of degrees. Mm. Anybody who really applies themselves can do it. Several years ago, more years than I care to think about, I really started, uh, I guess it was almost a hobby, so studying about screenwriting. I have, I'm looking at a whole shelf uh, load of books on screenwriting. Well, that didn't go anywhere, but it, it did have a, a major benefit for me. It made me a better writer. Hmm. So about a year and a half ago, I decided, well, why don't I try writing a novel? I love it. So, David, this is fantastic, your very first novel, and I, I love what this says about it. It says, what would you do if you found yourself in another universe? And I'm already hooked. I'm already <laughs> hooked, David. Uh, what's this all about? Can you give me a flavor for what we were in store for? Assuming that parallel uh, universes exist, and I don't even at all sure that they do. I'm not a big believer in that myself. But mm. if they do exist, there have to be a, a lot of parallels, right? For myself in this book, I accomplished that by making just a few people resemble other individuals in the other universe. Hmm. Problem is, the similarity ends there. And they are really different, and everything about the other universe is really different. And that, hence, that's the title, One Sad Universe. That's not our universe. That is their universe. Uh, got it. The protagonist in my story he gets depressed. I even talk about that in the, in the book. He gets mm. uh, has the periods of depression, but he never loses his optimism. And that really is the theme of the story. If it constant effort and keep up an optimistic viewpoint that uh, at the end, everything will work out, you will be successful. And he gets a lot of, unex like I say in the notes about the book, I have some uh, very surprising, unexpected help that occurs, and I don't want to spoil <laughs> anybody's uh, reading of it, because it is a short novel. It is short. How long did this take you to write, David, once you sat down and got at it? Uh, what kind of a time frame are we looking at? I probably got the entire thing done with a lot of rewriting in, in uh, two or th about three months. Yeah, not too bad. I've already spent three times that much on my new book. <laughs> <laughs> what did you find the most challenging part about the writing or the publishing process? Well, don't get me started on the publishing, but the writing... Writing is rewriting. Mm. And I haven't even mentioned that I was a former high school English teacher. I really tried to uh, you know, hit him over the head with that. <laughs> writing is rewriting. You know, it's just so easy to ignore that. And it's, it, it means uh, so much that you can always think of a better way to say something more concise, succinct, and everything else. The unexpected benefit to studying screenwriting, when I wrote the book, I said, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> In a 50-page book, it is full of action. I have lots and lots of action. Would you do it again? You think maybe you'll have a follow-up to this one or doing some other kind of writing? Well, absolutely. In fact, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And let me tell you real quickly, one of the authors I really respect and I like reading is, is, is Fitzgerald, that's Scott Fitzgerald. Mm, wonderful, yeah. And he is so concise and brief, you know, succinct, you know, just right to the point, right? Well, I try, and, and One Small Universe really tries to echo that. I don't have nearly Fitzgerald's talent, not even a tenth of it, <laughs> but I really try to echo that so much more than in my forthcoming book in about hopefully in four to six months called, are you ready, Getting Harry to Mars. I, from what I understand, traditional publishers really want you to write a series of books. You know, get one on one topic right. I am not, that is not my cup of tea at all. I could not write a series of books. Now, having said that, both in the One Sad Universe and the Harry book, the main characters each are cousins to each other. The new one is set about 2034, where the universe is set in the current day. 
Well, I think a lot of readers are going to be into this book, and I encourage everyone out there to check this one out. It's titled One Sad Universe. It's written by David B. Roach and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. You can find it anywhere, like Amazon or Barnes & Noble, iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. David, thank you again for joining me here on the show and telling me about this book. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm delighted to be joined right now here at the Reader House Author Roundtable with author Kenneth Pingle. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here with me tonight. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I certainly appreciate your time, Ken. You have a new book out. Wanted to congratulate you on that. It's titled Through My Eyes, Bible Verses in Pictures. Ken, can you tell me what readers are in store for here? Well, I've been an amateur photographer my whole life, and I've taken a lot of beautiful pictures from literally all over the world. My profession allowed that. Hmm. And I decided through some encouragement from a local pastor, we're good friends, to why don't we start putting Bible verses to these pictures? So that's basically how it all got started, and so here we are today. Mm -hmm. Ken, what kind of readers do you think would be really into Through My Eyes? That's really going to be interesting to find out. (laughs) Hopefully, all types of readers. I think a lot of people today with their families and work and everything going on, they're very busy. Mm -hmm. They don't spend a lot of time specifically on one thing. And they're missing so much that's right before their eyes that's happening. Mm. And so I hope maybe people will slow down a little bit and just see the beauty that's right before their eyes. And then with the Bible verses, maybe take it a little bit further once they read the Bible verse and do a little reflection and maybe bring a a little bit of peace to their soul. And so that's kind of what's behind the book. Mm. Ken, once you got the idea and you sat down, started working on this book, how long of a process was it for you to put it all together, then get it published? Oh, the whole process from when I started has probably been a little over a year when I first put the basics of the book together, and then I sent it to Christian Faith Publishing. And they looked at the book, and after some conversations back and forth, we decided well, maybe we ought to go ahead and do this. This looks rather interesting, and it's not your normal novel that people would write. It's a quick sit-down read, do some reflection, both through the pictures and the Bible verses. And when it comes to writing and publishing, Ken, was this all new to you? Oh, it's brand new. I never in my wildest dreams thought I would do something like this. I've been blessed in my profession to go to some absolutely beautiful places in the world. And I've seen beautiful sights all around. And, you know, I've always appreciated this. So hopefully other people will do the same. I can imagine that moment when that book came in, that physical copy, and you saw your name on the cover. And this is your book you've been working on. That must have been a surreal moment for you, Ken. What was that like? Well, it really was. I've been kind of a one-dimensional person, focused on my career, a a flying career. And to do something like this is so off the wall for me. And when you put it all together, you wonder, well, you know, is is this going to work out? Is is this going to turn out like you want it? And all of a sudden, everything kind of comes together. And so here we are today. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of authors listening to us right now who are just starting out, just like you, Ken. Do you have any advice, anything that you learned along the way that you could offer them? Well, take your time listening to the people that are helping you with the book. Nothing good happens really fast. I Mm. found that out. So just have some patience because everything ultimately falls into place like you were told. And then now you sit and you hope, okay, we've done this, and I'm really proud of it. It's come out really good. Now, if we have a little bit of success with it, that would be great. What are the chances, Ken, that we'll be seeing more writing and publishing from you here in the future? Good Lord, I've got thousands and thousands of pictures. (laughs) And I still take pictures as a hobby. And if this should work out, you know, who knows down the road. Hopefully, I just want to see people enjoy this book. My family, I know they thought I could never do anything like this. So this is going to be a very surprise for them. 
I think a lot of people will be blessed by this book. It's titled Through My Eyes, Bible Verses in Pictures. It's written by Kenneth Pingle, published by Christian Faith Publishing, and you can get it anywhere. So get onto Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, also traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to find this book. Ken, I appreciate you coming on the show and telling me about your wonderful work. I had a nice time talking with you tonight. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your interest and your time. Sitting here right next to me at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Betty Fontaine Thompson. Betty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate your time, and you got a new book out in stores called God's Hand on My Life. He has never let me go. And I understand that this is the story of God's constant provision in every circumstance of your life, Betty. So can you tell me more about this? Yes. I'm 72 years old, and I've been through a lot of ups and downs in my life, and I decided to write it all down. I didn't write it. I typed it on my computer, and I believe I was inspired by God to do it. Hmm. It's aimed to help people who need to know that God is with them, no matter what they're going through. So it's a book full of hope. Betty, what was that spark that inspired you to say, hey, i got to sit down and start writing this book? Well, to be honest with you, it was the Lord. He has been very active in my life in the last two years, and He just gave me the inspiration to do it, and I just did it. I didn't talk about it with anybody else. I just sat down and did it. How long of a process was this for you to write it and then get it published? Well, it took me just two weeks to write it. It just flowed once I got started. It took over a year to get it all the way published and out with everything that I get with it. I have it as an audio book, as an e-book, and as a paperback book. So it took a year to get it all done. Wow. Then after all that time, Betty, the day comes and you finally get your first copy in the mail that you can hold in your hands. What was that day like for you? That was so exciting. Mm. It was just the most rewarding day and gave me a lot of joy and satisfaction. My publisher is wonderful, Christian Faith Publishing, and they've been an excellent publisher. I've enjoyed working with them. Betty, we have a lot of first-time authors listening to us right now that have never been published. Do you have any advice, anything you learned along the way that you could pass on to them? Yes. First, decide exactly what you want to write about. And then I did an outline of what I wanted to write, and it worked itself into my chapters very easily. And then, of course, once you have written it, I sent it out as a manuscript to several good friends and family members to find out if they thought it was worth trying to get it published. And they did. I got great encouragement Mm. right off the bat. And then I wanted a Christian-based publishing company. And I found good reviews of Christian Faith Publishing. The people there were so welcoming. I just cannot say enough about the people at Christian Faith Publishing. Betty, would you do it again? What are the chances we might see another book from you in the future? Right now, I don't have another one in me except things have happened in my life since I wrote this. So I thought about an expanded edition, but that would probably be a little bit in the future. I really want to encourage other people to write their life stories. You know, everybody has a life story. And I would like to encourage other people who want to tell about their life to do it. Just do it. And it's a very, very rewarding experience. Can you think of somebody in your life that you look to for inspiration, especially when it comes to this kind of stuff, this stuff you write? Well, my older sister is an English professor, retired, and she has written a book. In fact, all of my siblings have written books or part of books. So I, I think it's in my family. But as far as a person, I would say my mother was my inspiration for the story. She was a great Christian woman who inspired my faith and took me through a lot of the difficult times that I had in my life. But she was really my inspiration, along with my siblings. I know a lot of readers are going to find hope and encouragement in the pages of this book. It's titled, God's Hand on My Life. He Has Never Let Me Go. This is written by Betty Fontaine Thompson. It's published by Christian Faith Publishing, 
and you can find it anywhere. So head on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or even traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you'll be able to find this book. Betty, thanks again for joining me here tonight and tell me all about your work. I had a nice time talking. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it, too. The Heart of the Samaritan, unveiling one of the most beloved and misunderstood stories in the New Testament. This is the new book. It just hit store shelves. It's written by Charles Tremblay. And Charles is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. And we get to talk all about this book. Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That's my pleasure. Charles, can you tell me all about The Heart of the Samaritan? What can readers expect? Well, it's a book about the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is so well-known and well-loved. It's something that crosses cultural barriers. It's something that it's a story that is referenced and talked about and loved by Christians and non-Christians alike. Mm -hmm. But there's deeper meanings in, hidden in the story. The story is only five verses in the New Testament, but there's all kinds of rich typology in the story. There's many of the main aspects of Christianity are summed up in picture form in the way that the story is presented. So there's hidden elements in the parable that tell the story of the fall of man and the redemption of man and the Savior who saves mankind and the promise of the Savior to return. It's, it's all there and it, and it goes really deep. And so the book is actually in two parts because the first half of the book deals with the symbolism and the typology and the story. But there's another element to it, which is that the way most people consider the story of the Good Samaritan, they think of it as a story about compassion for a stranger. You know, you see somebody that you don't know in need and you do something to help or to meet the need that's there. And that makes you a Good Samaritan. You see it in newspapers and on the Internet and all over the place that you'll hear and see the Good Samaritan did this and a Good Samaritan did that. Mm. But if you understand the relationship between the characters the story, which would have been a Jewish man and the Samaritan, it's such an antagonistic and adversarial relationship that these would have been natural enemies. Mm. And so it's very different to see somebody you don't know, a stranger, and, and have some compassion for them. But it's actually a story about mercy for your enemy. And that's something that's a lot harder and requires a lot more. And it's something that I feel like our culture is in need of more of at this time. Mm. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this element of it out. Jesus says it's easy to love those who love you. But the thing that makes Christianity unique and, and powerful is the commandment to love your enemies and to do good to those who persecute you. Now, Charles, how did this come about? You know, the, the story of the Good Samaritan, like you said, it's very familiar to us. So how did you pull all of these hidden things out? How did you recognize those and then decide to write a book about it? Well, when I became a Christian, I started reading the Bible from the beginning and going through, and I was amazed at how much symbolism and typology there was all through the Old Testament stories. And I became really fascinated with the underlying symbolism. And I actually wanted to write a book about the book of Esther because I found so much in there. But I was trying to find a way to showcase the methodology or the interpretive style that I was using to look at the Old Testament stories. And I realized that there was a parallel in the way that the parables in the New Testament were presented, that Jesus said he spoke in parables because for those who couldn't see, they wouldn't be able to see. But for those who could see, there was there was more to the parables than what was on the surface. And so I was looking for like a proof text sort of, or an example text of the way that the parables spoke truth with these undercurrents so that I could then apply them to kind of some Old Testament interpretation of some of the some of the stories and the narratives in the Old Testament. And so originally the Good Samaritan was just going to be a introduction to the book of Esther that I wanted to write about. And it just took on its own life. It just kept growing and I kept mm -hmm. finding more more and more in there. It just grew and had its own life and became its own thing. And I decided, well, I needed to put this out separately and independently. And it was like a good first shot across the bow. And I know readers are really going to be into this book. I encourage everyone listening right now to go and check it out. It's titled The Heart of the Samaritan, unveiling one of the most beloved and misunderstood stories in the New Testament. This is written by Charles Tremblay, published by Christian Faith Publishing. 
It's available anywhere, so head over to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, traditional brick-and-mortar stores, anywhere like that, you'll be able to find this book. Charles, I really appreciate you coming on the show and telling me all about this book. Thanks again. Thank you. Have a great night. The Boy from Chile. It's the name of the new book, Just Hit Stores, written by Jamie S. Fuentes. And the author, Jamie, is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. We get to talk all about this book. Jamie, welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Jamie, can you tell me all about The Boy from Chile? Yes. I started writing that book because I wanted to tell people about my story because I think my life is kind of interesting. I was born in Chile, and I came here to the United States when I was 11 years old. And I began by telling about myself in Chile, and then the transition when I came here going to school and having friends and the difference, a little bit of the difference between Chile and here in the United States. Mm. And I started writing the book as a hobby. I wasn't sure that it, they were going to print it. <laughs> you know, I just started doing it as a hobby, and here it's, it's been printed, so I'm, I'm really surprised about that, and I'm happy about that as well. <laughs> Jamie, how long of a process was this for you to write and publish? Well, I started writing the book back in 2013 because I was still working. And again, I uh, I was doing it like part time because I was working full time, and you know you don't have time to be writing the book. And then about uh, maybe seven years later, in 2020, somewhere on there, I decided to continue writing the book. And then I retired, so I was able to do it. And I was able to complete it. And again, I was surprised that they approved it for publishing because I'm really I'm, I'm glad about that. And I'm happy about that. Jamie, what sorts of readers were you speaking to here? Did you have sort of a target audience in mind? I want everybody to read my book because I think my life is kind of interesting. Mm. So I don't really have a particular age group. I mean, I want everybody to buy the book and, and read the book. So hopefully they will. So. And when it comes to writing and publishing, things like that, Jamie, have you ever done anything like this before? Yeah, my first book, and that's why I didn't, I didn't know what I, what I was actually doing. <laughs> so let me explain to you what happened. When I was writing, when I was in the middle of the, writing the book, I talked to the social worker that I know. And her husband, he writes medical journals, so she knows about writing. So one day I went up to her and I said, look, all right, Gail, I'm writing this book. Tell me what you think about it. So I gave her like about maybe four pages of my book. And she said, right at the back, she said, if I give it right back to you, I'm not interested. So I gave it to her, and she was reading it, and she said, this is really good. Mm. And she liked it. So she could read it, and she said, well, the rest of it, you want to read more. So, <laughs> so that gave me the encouragement to say, okay, maybe this is good enough for publishing. So then what I did, I went on the computer, I went on Google search, and I asked, how do you publish a book? Because I haven't done it before. So I answered, I answered some questions. Then the next day, I got an email from publishers that they were interested in my book. And that's how I got started. And then one of the, I went with uh, Christian Faith Publishing because they were, I liked them the way that they talked to me. I, I talked to other publishers, but they were kind of pushing me to finish the book. Mm. And that's why I went with Christian Faith Publishing. When that day came, Jamie, and you finally got that first copy in, you got to hold this thing in your hands for the first time. What was that like? Uh, it, was, it was a good feeling. It was a good feeling because uh, for a long time, because it took a long time for it to get published. If I started writing it, I think about a year ago. Sometime in July, I think it was last year, and then it took a long time for it to prepare it. The book was printed in February of this year, so that's a long time. So I was, I was telling people, my brother and other people, I, I, you know, this book is going to be published. But a lot of them, a lot of them didn't believe me because, you know, what's going on? What's taking so long? <laughs> and I had thought myself, I said, well, you know, I'm not really going to believe it until I have the actual book in my hand. So and then I get the book, and I was really glad about that. Jamie, do you think you got another book in yet? Do you think you'd do it again and publish more? I'm already doing that. Oh, is this one along the lines of the first one you wrote, or are you going somewhere different? No, I think it's going to be, it's going to be fiction, because I'm already wrote about mm -hmm. myself. And I tried writing another book more about what I'm doing here in my life and all that, but that was a little bit difficult to do because since I've already wrote about myself, it was like uh, a repeat of the other book, and I don't want to mm -hmm. do that. And I did have an idea, but I kind of had to expand a little bit more. So then I just decided to let me write something, a fiction book, which is what I'm doing right now. Well, I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this book. It's titled The Boy from Chile. It's written by Jamie H. Fuentes, and it's published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can find it everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes, everywhere that you buy your books. 
Well, Jamie, thank you again for coming on the show and telling me about your book. I had a nice time. Hey, thank you, Cora. Thank you for calling me. Would you risk your life to follow your dreams? Well, the author I'm talking with next did just that, and she wrote a book all about it. The author is Melissa Jones, and the book is Their Bun, Our Oven, Memoirs of a Surrogate. Now, Melissa is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about this book. Melissa, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm excited to be talking about your book, Their Bun, Our Oven. Uh, Melissa, can you tell me what we're in store for? So this story was actually not originally intended to be a novel at all. I had always dreamed of being a surrogate. It was definitely something that was put on my heart to do for as long as I can really remember. Mm -hmm. When we finally finished our family and embarked on that journey and I made my friends aware of it, they said, oh my gosh, you have to write a blog. And I was, oh no, no, I, I can't write a blog, no. And mm -hmm. Then we kind of hit our first hurdle, and on the plane ride home from the first kind of big bump in the road, I just immediately started writing, mm. and it actually became really therapeutic. So then when the story finished, everyone said, oh my gosh, you've got to turn your blog into a book, and here we are. Did you have a specific readership and audience in mind when you were writing, Melissa? Not at all. It was really just kind of a way for friends and family to stay connected to what was going on. Everyone was really interested in just the general process of a surrogacy. It's very common to know about a surrogacy, but it's not as common to know someone personally who is going through a surrogacy. Mm -hmm. So it was really just meant for my friends and family at the beginning. For one, it's just a good story. It really was kind of a roller coaster ride and obviously ended on a very chaotic kind of traumatic note. Everything's fine in the long run, but I'm hoping to, you know, I don't want to discourage people from the idea of being a surrogate because what happened with me was kind of a 5% chance of a 5% chance of a 5% chance of things happening the way that they did. Wow. But I think it is important to know that there are risks to putting your body through something like this. But the connection and everything with the family is so magical. I do hope it does encourage those who have the heart for it to, to keep going for it. Mm. Melissa, once you decided to sit down and begin working on this book, how long of a process was it for you until it was published? Oof. So it actually just popped up on my social media memories that four years ago yesterday, I sat down and went from taking the blog to a book. Hmm. The boy is now four and a half. So he was about six months old when I said, all right, let's do this. And we kind of took the blog format and started changing some things to make it read more, a bit more like a novel, but still kind of keeping that almost diary type sense to it. And then filling in everything that I didn't fill in from beforehand, from starting at the point where I did start the blog and then COVID and, you know, everyone thought, oh, you'll have all this free time in COVID. And we, we didn't <laughs> So as mothers of small children. And so, yeah, it mm. took me almost exactly four years between when I sat down to start moving blog to book until I had books on my dining room table. And I can only imagine that moment when you got that first physical one in, Melissa. You got to hold it in your hands and look at <laughs> it. Can you tell me about that? My daughter and I were coming home from our Taekwondo class, and I pulled into the driveway, and I just saw boxes on the front porch. And, you know, I just kind of, oh, my gosh, the books are here. And she and I just, I mean, we barely parked the car, and we both just jumped out, and we ran into the front porch and grabbed the boxes and took them and just immediately opened them up. And it is just such a cool experience to walk through all of it. There's so much that goes into publishing that I had no idea <laughs> along the way. I learned so much just in this kind of year that I've actually formally been working towards this process, probably a year and a half. But it was a really cool moment, and especially to, to share it with my girls. You know, they've obviously been very involved in the process. So it was really, really cool. Well, I know a lot of people's lives are going to be touched by this book. It's titled Their Bun, Our Oven, Memoirs of a Surrogate. It's written by Melissa Jones, and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. And you can find it everywhere. So get on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores, and you can find this book. Melissa, thank you so much again for joining me and telling me all about this book. I had a nice time with you tonight. Thank you, sir. This is the thrilling tale of two lovers and their family's role in their magical world's history. 
The name of the book is The Curus Chronicles, Chronicle 1, and the author, J.S. Lohman, is sitting right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, and we get to talk all about this book. J.S., welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Why, Corey, thank you for having me. The pleasure is all mine. Now, the audiobook just came out of The Curus Chronicles, Chronicle 1. So, J.S., can you tell me what readers are in store for here? Well, yeah, actually, I'm hoping that they're going to be enthralled by the work that I've done. The Curse Chronicles, the first one here, is an introduction into the world in which Curse and Virago live and an introduction to members of their family. And so I'm hoping that I can whet their appetite for more of the tales of Curse and Virago and the Curse Chronicles. Hmm. Would you say this is a book that fantasy readers would love the most? Oh, I'm hoping so. My um, target audience is actually fantasy sword and sorcery lovers, fantasy fans, and D&D players throughout the world. Hmm. And where did the idea for this come from? I love the idea for the story here. Uh, what was that spark? Well, actually, Curse and Maraca were two of the characters that decades ago I used to play in Dungeons and & Dragons. And so these tales are inspired by events that happened in those Dungeons & Dragons games and all of the things that transpired and evolved from that. It's kind of like fantasy reality mimicking reality fantasy. <laughs> when it comes to writing and, and publishing and everything, J.S., is this your first time? Yes, it is. And so I'm hoping people will um, bear with me, <laughs> try to make it as entertaining as I could. And I'm told that it's pretty entertaining, so we'll see how it works out. Now, being your first book, did it take you a really long time to write and then put through that publishing process? Actually, it took me, from the actual time I started sitting down and writing, it took about two years to get to completion, which isn't a long time at all from what I'm told. My audiobook publisher, Audiobook Network, they found me the best narrator I could have looked for anywhere, Corey, in Gil Mills. She has done such a fantastic job of telling the story from Aura's perspective, and that's who the narration is coming from in the book is Aura, one of the characters. Then after all that time and so much hard work that goes into something like writing and publishing a book, J.S., the day finally comes. You get your first physical copy and you get to hold this thing with your name on the cover that you've put so much time and effort into. What was that moment like for you? It was probably one of the top six moments in my life. The top five being the birth of my five sons. <laughs> but that was it was right up there with those and with marrying my wife. It was pretty intense for it. Wow. A lot of people listening to us right now are authors who are just starting out in this whole world. So, uh, J.S., what have you picked up or learned along the way that maybe you could pass on as some advice? Don't be afraid to take criticism for your work. It'll just make you better. And also... Pay attention to the marketing because that's actually the biggest part of getting your book out there mm. is the marketing end of it. And like many writers, I don't have a clue about marketing. <laughs> so I, that would be the one thing I would tell people to try to gain as much knowledge as you can about what you need to do to put your book out there. And J.S., how much of this story was outlined ahead of time and went according to the outline? And how much of this story did you find just happened while you were writing it? Well, naturally, I've done an outline on this is the first of many books, I'm hoping. Mm. <laughs> I, at least I had the outlines for them. Right? But it seemed that in writing it, it would reach points where the characters would literally not let me progress <laughs> until I worked out the part that they were in. It astounded me. I really didn't want to admit that's what was going on, but uh, it's kind of what was going on. <laughs> Well, this story sounds really exciting. I think it's going to be a great series. I encourage everyone listening to go check this out. The title is The Curus Chronicles, Chronicle 1. It's written by J.S. Lohman, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So head over to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, and you can pick this one up. J.S., thank you so much again for joining me and telling me all about this series, all about your work. I had a nice time. Corey, thank you very much for having me. And hey, I'm about halfway through part two. There's a new audio book that just hit stores. It challenges readers to take ownership of their lives and become what they respect. This is called The Warrior Within. 
The author is Nitke's dad. And the author, Doug, is right here with me now. We're going to talk all about it. Doug, welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for the opportunity. The pleasure is all mine. Doug, what can readers, listeners expect whenever they listen to The Warrior Within? Probably depending on what they're looking for. I mean, there's a lot of things that we say what we want, but very few people know what they need. So what they'll likely take away from this is understanding that what we want may not necessarily be what we need in order to grow and be happy in life. I mean, the purpose in life is to live it, not merely exist in it. And that's easier said than done for a lot of people. It's a struggle for some, it's harder for others, but it's really about a mindset. And ultimately, it comes down to when you look at the reflection you see in the mirror, can you be honest with what you see? I'm not asking anybody to be perfect and to look for perfection, but if you've got faults or failures, or if you've got things you want to change about yourself, the first place you've got to look at is that reflection and decide for yourself, I need to change this. And then it's a struggle, or if it's how do I go about doing it? And moving along that path that leads you down to changing your life. And that's hopefully where they start at. And it could be anything from their physical appearance, their weight, anything along those lines to how they react or respond to a family member or a friend who's just toxic and they don't know how to break free of it. Or even delving into the the craziness of politicians or politics. When you hear these individuals, these talking heads that only want to basically rile up your emotions and then ask for a campaign donation when they're really not interested in solving the problems. They're just in a perpetual campaign cycle. So a lot of these things, they don't really serve your purpose, but the choice is yours and how you respond and how you move forward is up to you. Doug, what sparked you to write this book? What inspired you to say, hey, I got to sit down and start writing? Ultimately, it was a Swedish singer by the name of Molly Sandian. I had seen a YouTube video of her in early January 2021, and this is when the height of the pandemic is going on, and her physical beauty and her voice just captured me. And then I started to notice subtle things changing the universe. I was getting more focused. I was actually starting to work out. I was starting to take care of things around my house, cleaning it up, you know, get rid of all that stuff in the medicine chest that expired. And then I had seen her performance on the Oscars a couple months later in the city of Husavik, Iceland. The northern lights were in the background, and it's something I've always wanted to see. And that just blew me away. And I'm like, okay, two days later, three days later, she was interviewing or being interviewed about owning her own story. And I couldn't understand what she was saying. She was talking in Swedish. The interview was in Swedish. But I could tell there was a strength and integrity about her. And it was at that moment I started... I need to write my own story. And I initially started doing this from the perspective of I didn't want to go into the detail, the emotional level detail with a potential significant other, but I did want them to know everything. So that's why I started writing what the inspiration was to write my own story. When I decided to publish it, it was after sharing some of these stories with strangers as I was doing Uber or just meeting people on the street and we were having conversations. And there was a connection and several people had said, you need to write a book. Mm. So when I finally heard that, it sunk in and I'm like, okay, I had already been writing for a while. Let me go ahead and look at publishing this. And I did that a couple months later, what it would take to publish it. So you had published before this. Would you call yourself a seasoned author then? Oh, God, no, I had never published before. This was my first outing. And it was still a little bit scary because I'm still learning as I go. What was it like listening to The Warrior Within as opposed to reading it? I was actually impressed with the the individual that I had selected to do the audio because the inflections that he had, the emotions, everything about it was exactly what I felt when I was writing it. Hmm. Well, I love the message of this book. It's titled The Warrior Within. It's written by Nitke's dad. And of course, the audiobook version is published by the Audiobook Network. And you can find it everywhere. So get on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or go to Amazon, any place that you find your audiobooks, and you'll be able to pick this up. Doug, thank you so much again for joining me here and telling me all about this. I had a nice time talking with you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity again. Regular listeners here at the Reader House Author Roundtable will be really happy to be hearing Rand Tubbs, the author of The Lord vs. Corruption, joining me again. Rand, welcome. Thank you for being here again. Thank you for having me. 
You've just released the audiobook version of The Lord vs. Corruption. That's so exciting. So, it's been a while since I talked with you the first time about this book. Could you remind us all what readers are in store for here and what you've written about in The Lord vs. Corruption? The book is a testimonial story of the many miracles and supernatural events that happened to me when I was sick for three and a half years, and I had three near-death experiences, and I had hearings and visions and a lot of miraculous things, and that's what the book is about. And you said that you never envisioned yourself as, as being an author, and, and this is your first one. Right. I never imagined I'd write a book when I was young or, you know, all through high school or college because I never did very good in English. I didn't like it. I was always, you know, left brain, just math and science. And I'm a chemist. That's how I really got sick to death was working in chemistry. So my writing this book is just a promise I made to the Lord. If I ever found my other son that was shown to me in a near-death experience, that that I'd write about all the other miracles that the Lord had done for me and other supernatural happenings. How long did this take you to write and put through all those publishing hoops? It took me about three and a half years to write it, and it was very hard for me. You know, at times I was stuck and just couldn't get moved on and and hard to, you know, recall some of the stuff exactly and like how to word it. It it was hard for me, and it was was a great relief when when I finally got done with it. Oh, I bet. Rand, were you writing towards a specific readership here? Are there certain readers out there that you think would really be into this? Well, this book is is really a great turning point, or it could re- get somebody really over a hump who is just coming to the Lord, mm. because it basically proves that life is eternal and that there's judgment at the end. Of course, we're talking about the audiobook version of The Lord vs. Corruption. Rand, what was it like whenever you heard your book as opposed to reading it? Hearing it was very touching, just just as touching as reading it. Really, a lot of the miracles and things, when I read through them, I start crying to myself anyway. It's very hard not to. When you're driving along the road, you can't read. I mean, it's very intriguing and gives a lot of knowledge of eternal life with Christ. And once you decided to go the audiobook route with this, was that whole thing a smooth process? Everything seems smooth to me. They, they basically, the narrator, they, they did all the work. Mm. At the end, just now, we had, you know, I had to help, help with some news release, some, some of the top you know, statements of what they wanted to say the book was about. I had to do a little bit of adjusting there, but other than that, they did a very good job. Aran, what are the chances that we'll see more books from you here in the future? Like I said, I'm not really an author. I don't really want to write another book, <laughs> but there, there is a possibility that this could continue on you know, through grandchildren and, and their effect of it. Mm-hmm. And if you were to write another book, Rand, is there anything that you think you would do differently this time around? I might, you know, try to get a little more, you know, quicker to the miracles and into the revelations and things that have happened. Because I've had some other things happen to me that's not even in this book, Mm. you know, that could still be added to it. And I also have, I call Troy Story, the my friend from high school that led me to the Lord when I was sick and dying. You know, there was nobody else that cared for me but him, you know, and he was my best friend from high school. And he had been trying to lead me to the Lord already because when we were only, he was 20 and I was 21, he died in a moped accident, you know, and he bled to death. And when he came back from life, he started telling me about Jesus and he prophesied my miracle healing also that's in my book. So I'd read a little bit more about him probably. As it is on the website, there is a Troy story. I just added that to it just recently and it's pretty incredible too. Rand, who inspires you in your life? Are are there people who you find can encourage you and motivate you, especially when you need it? Well, my wife and Troy was the only inspiration I had when I was sick and dying, but he passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. I'm sorry. It's been about it. It seems like so much of the world is is antichrist. You just become very lonely when you're Christian, at least in my town. (laughs) Well, I think a lot of people are going to find hope and inspiration in this book. And now you can listen to it, too. It's an audiobook. It's titled The Lord vs. Corruption. It's written by Rand Tubbs, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So go to Audible, the Apple iTunes Store, or Amazon, and you can pick this up there. Rand, thank you again for joining me and telling me about this book and about your story. I had a really nice time talking tonight. I've had a nice time talking to you also. Thanks a lot, and I'd just like to point out that my book really brings 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. It brings it right to life, and basically talks about judgment at the end of life. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. 
We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. Or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.